Good evening, everyone, and I'm glad that you're still with us uh, up to this last topic that we'll be discussing for uh, the scientific session for tonight. Uh, so uh, I'll be discussing very, very quickly one of the most important topics that every lifestyle medicine practitioner should be familiar with. And I should say also an expert in dealing with patients with diabetes type 2. I'm sure that many of us practitioners, whether uh, clinic-based or hospital-based, are already dealing with patients with diabetes. But I want to present here uh, to you uh, my patient, who is a 73-year-old male, who is a classic example of diabetes type 2. He visited their center for consult uh, with initially uh, about 20.15 millimoles per liter of blood sugar, and the patient has been already taking two medications for his diabetes, apart from um, other medications that he's been maintaining. And uh, he refused to start with insulin, and he wanted to try lifestyle medicine instead. And so we started with an intensive lifestyle intervention. And later, I will show you how the journey of this patient has been. Now we know that the prevalence of diabetes globally was about 108 million in 1980 and by 2014 you see the global population registered was 422 million type 2 diabetes cases and the prevalence is expected to another 50% increase by year 20 and 40. Now today in the Philippines one in every five Filipinos are either pre-diabetic or diabetic with the the highest rates among older, overweight, and individuals with hypertension. Now, looking at this, we see that the current disease management approach for type 2 diabetes is primarily aimed at delaying progression of the disease rather than remission, right? Now, whether we like it or not, when we talk with our colleagues and even when we listen to lectures about diabetes and education that uh, our uh, physicians are providing the patients, whenever the patient would would ask about possibility of reversal of diabetes, the next thing that we would hear commonly is that diabetes is non-curable, right? But tonight, I'd like to um, dissect very quickly the definition of diabetes remission and the possibility of reversal. Um, in lifestyle medicine, we always say that diabetes is the mother of many types of chronic diseases. And we are seeing younger population with these conditions. Now, as we look at the current evidences that are coming out, a shift toward treatment that cannot only prevent but also reverse type 2 diabetes and produce complete remission is the single greatest need in type 2 diabetes care. Now, the field of lifestyle medicine is poised to make this contribution. Now, several definitions of type 2 diabetes remission have already been circulated. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine uses the definition published by um, Buse et al. in 2009, which requires blood glucose level on par with the healthy individuals without diabetes. Now, remission here um, was defined by achieving glycemia below the diabetic range in the absence of pharmacologic therapy of at least one year duration. Now, they also defined partial remission, uh, which is a sub-diabetic hyperglycemia with HbA1c of less than 6.5% and the fasting glucose of 100 to 125 milligrams per DL. And they also defined um, complete remission, which is a return to normal measures of glucose metabolism with HbA1c in a normal range and a fasting glucose of less than 100 milligrams per DL. But here we have another um, leading definition of remission, which comes from the Association of British Clinical Diabetologists and the Primary Care um, Diabetes Society, who proposes similar but a lot simpler and less stringent definition that requires blood glucose level to fall below the diagnostic criteria of diabetes for a period of only six months. Now, here we can see that a growing number of clinical experts are already discussing the concept of remission as the treatment goal inspired by the outcomes observed following weight loss, fasting or fasting mimicking diet, bariatric surgery, and most recently, intensive lifestyle modification. 
Now, given the current upward trend in diabetes incidence um, and recognizing the need for intensive therapeutic lifestyle is essential to advance the solution to treat the costs of disease and contain the spiraling cost of diabetes management. Now, we also know that the underlying cause of diabetes type 2 have long been identified as excess weight and insulin resistance. But there has been a lack of consensus on whether insulin resistance may be the cause of excess weight or whether excess weight is um, caused by insulin resistance. But it has been suggested that there has been bi-directional relationship. Um, however, one thing these two causes have in common is that they most often result from excessive caloric intake that causes rapid insulin resistance due to the increased oxidative stress in as little as one to two days. Now, this occurs before weight has been gained. And we know that ongoing intake of excess and poorly chosen calories maintain the insulin resistance. We also know that human physiology actually preserves and conserves calories even when consumed to excess. And this is illustrated by morbid obesity. While adipose tissues store much of the excess calories, um, as the excess accumulates, it is stored in other tissues, notably in the liver and pancreas and also the muscles, right? Now, in this non-adipose tissues, caloric excess leads to lipotoxicity, and we all know that. Um, meaning the excess fat, which are called the intracellular lipids, are stored in these cells and inhibits their proper functioning. They disrupt normal glucose and insulin metabolism. Now, going to the myocellular lipotoxicity, we know that it inhibits glucose uptake, right, by affecting the glucose transporter. Now, this produces peripheral insulin resistance, which requires greater amount of insulin to push glucose into the muscle tissues. And this resistance is reduced with exercise as muscle tissue consume energy and they become more responsive to insulin. Now, if you look at pancreatic toxicity or lipotoxicity, on the other hand, this inhibits beta cell insulin production and reducing the amount of insulin that should be available supposed to be to overcome the insulin resistance in muscle and other energy consuming tissues. I would want to discuss more on the pathophysiology of diabetes type 2 remission and reversal, its development, so on and so forth. But um, anyway, you'll be learning this, you know, as you go along with your course in prediabetes and diabetes reversal. For those who are uh, already enrolled uh, on that course, so uh, I'm sure that you have been starting to work on your modules. But let me go straight to lifestyle medicine intervention. I wanted to emphasize here that the importance of appropriate dosing in the context of lifestyle modification can be hardly overstated. Dosing is a prime therapeutic importance in a pharmaceutical context, and in lifestyle medicine, it is no different. Okay, now the same dosing principle applies to lifestyle medicine. So that means the lifestyle modification required to produce type 2 diabetes remission are significantly more intensive than those sufficient to prevent type 2 diabetes only. Now, clinicians whose patients achieve remission do so by using sufficiently dosed lifestyle changes such as diet, exercise, and other behavioral intervention, as you can see here. Uh, in this uh, published paper. Now, remission is not reported, take note, in inadequately dosed lifestyle changes such as for example, eating more salad or simply reducing meat consumption uh, in each meal. Um, research show now that remission is achievable for a majority of short duration of less than about eight years type 2 diabetes patients and many with longer duration with sufficiently intense lifestyle medicine interventions. 
But we also have to take note that we also have failures in the in the lifestyle programs that we offer patients, right? But most failures are due to inadequate dosing of lifestyle medicine and not to any inherent deficiency of lifestyle medicine as treatment. Now, patients find uh, lifestyle medicine treatment acceptable and desirable when treatment produces remission. And this you can see um, in this study. Now, a personal demonstration of remission can reset the lifestyle goals patients set for themselves. Now, um, um, at the time, the degree of dosing is influenced by the patient's willingness uh, to change and the inherent challenges in making adequate changes without adequate support and guidance. Uh, now here in this paper, you will see that adherence to conventional diet and lifestyle guidelines for diabetes management has been identified as problematic for type 2 diabetes patients specifically. Now identified key barriers uh, include the lack of communication and the support from healthcare providers as well as inadequate education provided to them. Uh, basically, we only see patients for like 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, and of course, education may not be may not be sufficient, you know, with that very limited time. And here, this is where lifestyle medicine specialists provide the education, the support, and modeling necessary to successfully and realistically achieve a sufficiently strong intervention dose and, of course, to accomplish the goal of remission. Now, research show that sufficiently dosing of lifestyle interventions will induce remission in half or more of subjects with type 2 diabetes. Studies also reveal that not all lifestyle interventions produce remission and that remission rates are lower for longer duration type 2 diabetes. And we also have to take note of that. So this is not one size fits all, okay? It doesn't really mean that you provide lifestyle intervention to patients with diabetes. We are sure that they can get well, okay? They, we are sure that we can reverse their condition. Um, and adherence and individual factors may also affect the remission rates. All right. Um, now, the highest remission rates, uh, looking at the studies, uh, are also seen and noted similar to those with bariatric surgery. Um, here, I want to share with you uh, this slide. Uh, you see, prior to 1997, the diagnostic criteria for diabetes was a fasting blood glucose of 140. Uh, but it was also uh, in 1997 that a large consensus came together and changed the diagnostic criteria of diabetes from 140 to 126 fasting blood glucose, right? Now, the reason being is because of the exponential increased risk of complications that begin to curve up powerfully noted at around 126. Now, um, and, and this number catches the cases early as well. Now, it was also in 1997 um, that Dr. West and his colleagues actually created this five stages of blood sugar increase. Now, this chart emphasizes um, that diabetes is not the beginning of the high blood sugar. And many other um, biological processes um, happened prior to that. Okay, now it provides education to patients uh, of where they were in every stage relative to their diabetes. And this is a very good educational reference that was published by the Department of Health and Social Services of Guam uh, with a grant coming from the uh, Center for Disease Control. And uh, we also uh, take note that in, in 1997, uh, that the new criteria to define prediabetes was also published. I personally use this chart because uh, I could see that uh, patients would use this as reference as to where they are in their journey in, in remission, you know, uh, of their condition, whether they are progressing or whether there is regression uh, of their condition. Um, here you will see that in 2009, the American Diabetes Association finally came out with a definitive guideline on how to define cure of diabetes. Uh, in fact, this is a very, very well done paper. 
And they have this very nice statement, I should say, uh, with a mission. You know, their mission is to prevent and cure diabetes and improve lives of all people who are affected by diabetes. Lifestyle medicine specialists could not agree more with the American Diabetes Association statement. Now, the key issue now here is we have to live with that mission and translate this to patients' care. Patients should know and understand that diabetes prevention and cure are the goals for them. So when patients with diabetes visits our clinic for consults, our goal should be to cure that diabetes. The goal is to help patients understand the necessary elements to accomplish diabetes cure by providing them education and skills to accomplish such goal if it's at all possible. So I hope that from now on, whenever we hear our colleagues telling us or telling our patients that diabetes is incurable, that it is a disease for life, this is the chance, you know, a chance for us to share and for, for us to, to educate them as well. That it has been defined long, long time ago. It's just that it's not translated to clinical care for patients with diabetes. Now, before I end this very quick presentation, I wanted to uh, again flash here uh, the result, you know, of the program that we provided with the 73-year-old male patient. Again, we started with a, a blood glucose of 20.5 and HbA1c of 11.2, uh, providing him education and lifestyle medicine intervention with the right dose that we need for us to achieve, hopefully, remission. Uh, you will see that from June of 2020 and the latest follow-up was um, January 13 of 20. 2021, you will see here that the uh, fasting blood glucose of the patient and the HbA1c of the patient does not fall on the criteria for the patient to be diagnosed with diabetes. So we just have to maintain this and uh, help patients sustain the, the intervention and so that we can uh, prolong this for about six months minimum for us to finally define diabetes remission in this case. Now, if you want to learn more about diabetes reversal or reversal or pre-diabetes reversal, you may join uh, the course that the Philippine College of Lifestyle Medicine is offering, and uh, that is already open now, and the uh, first batch is already ongoing. So again, I'd like to thank you for joining our scientific sessions, and I hope that like me, you've, already, you've also learned a lot of um, inputs from our speakers and the cases that were presented. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and uh, we hope to see you more in the next upcoming uh, uh, events of the Philippine College of Lifestyle Medicine. Good evening.